Welcome to the Economist in Your Ear podcast. Today, we're diving straight into a, a really fascinating and, well, increasingly relevant topic, this surge in testosterone replacement therapy, TRT, among American men. Yeah, it's definitely gone mainstream. For a long time, TRT was, you know, a very specialized medical treatment, something you'd only really look at with a clear, specific diagnosis. Right. Very niche. But if you've been paying attention lately, I mean, it's kind of exploded. It's become this mainstream wellness trend. Totally. You see dedicated clinics popping up, uh, celebrity endorsements. It's a whole different landscape now. Exactly. The Economist recently explored this uh, phenomenon, really zooming in on the business side of things, how it's expanding commercially. And, you know, while that article does a really excellent job capturing the sheer scale of this demand mm. and uh, the market forces driving it, we wanted to go a bit deeper. Go beyond the surface. Yeah. We've pulled from, well, a bunch of additional perspectives and some pretty in-depth research to really unpack what's happening here. So our mission today is to kind of critically examine some of the economists' claims, maybe some omissions, too. Precisely. We wanted to give you, the listener, a more nuanced understanding of this whole uh, rapidly evolving picture. We'll look at what they got right, what maybe got underplayed, and you know the bigger forces shaping it all. Okay, sounds good. Let's start with what the economists really nailed: this picture of just incredibly rapid growth. Just pretty stark. Yeah, I mean, imagine walking into a clinic. It feels less like a doctor's office and more like I don't know a high-end sports lounge or something. A man cave concept, yeah. That's the vibe game day men's health has cultivated. You know, black leather armchairs, big TVs, drinks. Right. It's designed for comfort, speed, convenience. Totally. You can literally walk in, get a blood test, and potentially walk out with your first testosterone shot within the hour. Which is a huge shift from traditional medicine. It really is. And this business model, well, it's clearly working. Game Day alone launched, what, 325 new franchises in just 14 months? Wow. That kind of expansion is... Mm. Yeah, it's astonishing. It really speaks to a massive demand out there. And the numbers back that up, right? Prescriptions jumped like crazy. Oh, absolutely. From about 7.3 million in 2019 to uh, 11 million in 2024. That's a huge leap in just five years. And it's not just older guys anymore. No, that's the really interesting part. Well, yeah, middle-aged men are still the biggest users, the fastest relative growth. It's in men under 35. Really? How fast? We're talking an 86% jump in the 25 to 34 age group between 2018 and 2022 alone. 86%. Wow. That's a significant shift. Makes you wonder why younger men are turning to it. Exactly. It raises a lot of questions. And The Economist rightly points out this isn't just some you know superficial craze. For a lot of men, it's addressing a real medical problem. That's true. There's solid evidence suggesting average testosterone levels are lower today than decades ago. Why is that? Well, it seems linked to several factors. Rising rates of diabetes, obesity, maybe increased opioid use, even environmental toxins, uh, endocrine disruptors. Right. So when conditions like hypogonadism, actual diagnosed low T, go untreated, it can really impact quality of life. Hugely. For men who are genuinely deficient, TRT can make a massive difference. Better mood, sleep, libido, uh, even reducing body fat. That's a pretty powerful list of benefits. No wonder people are interested. Absolutely. And the market, well, it reflects that surge. The Economist correctly reported this widening supply bottleneck. Meaning they can't make it fast enough. Pretty much. Major products like Pfizer's Depot Testosterone and several generics are facing shortages because manufacturing just hasn't kept pace with this explosion in demand. Classic supply and demand squeeze. Okay, and critically, the article also mentioned that big study, the Traverse trial from 2023. That seemed like a big deal for safety concerns. It was a very big deal. For years, there were these nagging worries about TRT and heart issues, serious ones like heart attacks. It made doctors really cautious. Understandable. Then Traverse came along. It was a large randomized trial. And the headline finding was basically no excess in major adverse cardiac events. Think heart attack, stroke over about 22 months compared to placebo. So that calmed a lot of nerves. It definitely did. It helped ease some of those major fears, which is crucial info for everyone involved. Okay. But you mentioned nuances earlier. This is where things get a bit more complicated. Exactly. This is where we start to unpack maybe what was underplayed or perhaps overstated. The Economist suggested TRT is relatively safe based on Traverse. Sounds reasonable on the surface. But here's the thing, the key insight. Traverse, while reassuring on those major cardiac events, it specifically excluded arrhythmia endpoints. 
meaning irregular heartbeats like AFib. Precisely. It didn't track those. Mm -hmm. What's fascinating is that other research, separate cohort studies, actually link high normal testosterone levels, not even super high, just the upper end of normal, with about a 30% increase in the risk of developing new atrial fibrillation. Oh, that's yeah. significant. It is. And it raises a really important question is just being cardiovascularly neutral mm -hmm. on major events the same as having a true cardiovascular benefit, especially for therapy that might go on for decades. Right. Neutral isn't necessarily good, especially if other risks like AFib are potentially higher. It's not a blanket safe stamp. Not at all. It's definitely not a blanket clearance for all heart concerns. Okay, so that's one nuance. What about the prostate cancer fears? The article said those were dispelled. That sounds pretty final. Yeah, dispelled is a strong word and maybe, maybe a bit premature. How so? Well, look, a 2024 meta-analysis, so combining data from multiple studies, it found no reduction in prostate cancer risk with TRT and maybe even a slight increase in interventions for lower urinary tract symptoms. So not worse, but not necessarily better either, and maybe some other urinary issues. Kind of, and you connect that to the bigger picture. The truth is long-term surveillance data for TRT, especially beyond five years, it's still really thin. Ah, uh, so we don't really know the effects over 10, 20 years. We really don't. So while a direct significant increase in prostate cancer hasn't been definitively proven by Traverse in its time frame, saying all fears are dispelled, that doesn't quite capture the ongoing uncertainty and the lack of long-term data. Got it. Okay, now this next point seems really important, especially thinking about that 86% jump in younger guys using TRT infertility. Yes. This is a big one. The economist did acknowledge it, right? Mm. Said TRT can cause infertility if you don't give another hormone with it. And mentioned doctors seeing young guys with sky-high levels, super physiological, who had no idea they'd become infertile. Right. They touched on it. But what the article, I think, underplays is the sheer scale and potential permanence of this issue. Scale. How common is it? Well, recent case series and clinic audits, they now consider a zoospermia, that's the complete absence of sperm in the ejaculate, to be the commonest unintended outcome among men under 35 seeking TRT. The most common unintended outcome. Wow. Why does that happen? It's basic physiology, really. When you introduce external testosterone, your brain tells your body, okay, we've got enough, and signals the natural production to shut down. Unfortunately, that shutdown includes sperm production in the testicles. And does it come back if you stop? That's the really concerning part. Recovery of sperm counts. It only happens in about 25% of men once they stop therapy. Only one in four. Roughly, yeah. So think about what this means for millennials, the fastest growing user group, who are often still thinking about starting or expanding their families. Yeah, the implications are huge. Are these clinics talking about this up front? Well, that's the issue. Crucial fertility counseling, talking about sperm banking before starting therapy, or even discussing non-suppressive alternatives like clomiphene. It's often just missing from these clinic websites and initial consultations. That feels like a major gap in care, especially given the target audience. It's a huge oversight. And it really leads into that broader concern about the quality of care you get in this commercialized model. Right. How does the business side affect the medicine? The economists noted clinics vary in their quality of care mentioned online places not needing in-person checks. And the use of compounded pharmacies. Yeah, cheaper, but not FDA approved, risk of contamination, potency issues. But again, this variation can be much more serious than just you know slightly different standards. How serious? We're talking recent FDA warning letters, like in 2025, citing repeated sterility failures, meaning bacteria or other contaminants in the injectable product, and major potency failures at large compounding centers. Sterility failures, that sounds dangerous. It is. The FDA labeled these an imminent public health hazard. Think about it. Yeah. You could be injecting something contaminated or getting a dose that's way too low to work or way too high, causing serious side effects. That completely undermines both safety and effectiveness. Exactly. It begs the question, What's the basic consumer safety floor here? We're talking about unapproved products being injected regularly. It does feel a bit like the Wild West in some of these places. It really does. And that links to the guideline footing, right? How closely are they following medical best practices? The Economist described Game Day's approach as wanting to optimize how men feel. Right, suggesting even guys within the normal testosterone range could benefit. That sounds more like marketing than medicine. How does it square with the official guidelines? It really doesn't square well at all. The latest American Urological Association update from 2024 is still very clear. 
you need two separate low morning tests, specifically below 300 NGDL, before even considering treatment. Two tests below 300, that's specific. Very. And the guidelines explicitly discourage giving therapy to men who aren't actually deficient by that standard. So the commercial model is basically ignoring the established evidence base. In many cases, yes, it seems to be moving significantly beyond those guidelines, optimizing for subjective feelings, feeling better, getting your edge back, rather than strict evidence-based medical necessity. That's a concerning drift. Okay, so we've covered the clinical side, the business side. Let's step back. What about the bigger picture stuff, the structural forces? The economist may be glossed over. Good question. First, there's this idea of masculinity economics. What do you mean by that? Well, the economist focused on the market, but didn't really dig deep into how the marketing itself works. These clinics often tap into, maybe even exploit, anxieties around aging, body image, sexual performance. Ah, the get your prime back messaging. Exactly. It promises to restore vitality, your edge. It essentially medicalizes normal parts of aging, making men feel like something natural is a condition that needs fixing with a prescription. And that narrative distracts from real underlying issues? It certainly can. It shifts focus away from the actual upstream drivers of genuinely low T things like sedentary lifestyles, poor diet, maybe those endocrine disrupting chemicals we mentioned, or even mental health issues like depression or chronic stress. It's easier to sell a shot than a lifestyle change or tackling environmental toxins? Much easier. It's the quick fix appeal versus addressing broader, more systemic health challenges. And what about telehealth? You mentioned online clinics earlier. Deregulation played a role there. Absolutely. Telehealth offers amazing convenience, no doubt. Getting a prescription from home is appealing. But there's a catch. There can be. These online models often rely on subscription stickiness. It's super easy to sign up, sometimes after just a basic online form, but then you're on a recurring limit, maybe locked in. And the cost. Independent reviews show huge markups, sometimes 200-400% over what you'd pay for generic testosterone in person. Plus, the follow-up lab work, making sure levels are right and checking for side effects, can be really variable. Convenience sometimes comes at a cost, both financially and medically. Okay. And finally, you mentioned policy conjunctions, the RFK Jr. example. Yeah, it's quite striking. The economist mentioned his personal TRT use, sort of framing it as making TRT more mainstream, culturally legitimate. But what's fascinating, or maybe concerning, is the contrast. His own Health and Human Services Department recently tightened restrictions on things like puberty blockers for transgender adolescents, citing concerns about long-term hormonal risks. Right. A very cautious approach there. Very cautious. Yet at the same time, there seems to be this tacit acceptance, almost a blessing, of widespread testosterone use in otherwise healthy adult cisgender men, often just for optimization without nearly the same level of expressed concern about long-term hormonal risks. So a very different standard for risk tolerance depending on the hormone in the population. It appears that way. It reveals a really inconsistent stance on hormonal risk, driven perhaps less by pure science and more by cultural or political factors. It's, it's definitely something worth reflecting on in public health policy. That's a really powerful point. It shows how complex these conversations are, way beyond just the medical facts. Absolutely. It's a mix of medicine, market forces, cultural ideas about masculinity and policy decisions. Okay, so let's try and wrap this up. To recap, The Economist, they did a great job highlighting this huge demand surge, the convenience revolution happening in men's hormone care. That part's undeniable. For sure, they captured that dynamism really well. But by maybe focusing heavily on that market energy over the clinical guardrails, the piece arguably downplayed some lingering safety questions, like the arrhythmia risk. Understated the really significant subfertility consequences, especially for younger men. And maybe didn't fully explore how this lightly regulated cash pay industry can drift pretty far from evidence-based guidelines, potentially putting patients at risk. Right. So fuller picture, we think, treats TRT not just as some cool new wellness trend, but as what it yeah. is, a contested medical intervention. Yeah. Meaning it's long-term net benefit, especially for those who aren't strictly deficient, still really depends on getting things right. Mm. Stricter diagnosis, much better oversight of the products being sold, especially compounded ones. And taking a broader view. Exactly. A broader upstream view of men's health that looks at root causes, lifestyle, environment, mental well-being, instead of just jumping to the hormonal fix for the symptoms. Okay. So as we finish up, Navigating this world with ever-increasing access to wellness stuff, here's maybe a final provocative thought for you listening. 
What really stands out to you about balancing personal choice, the desire to feel optimized with public health responsibility when it comes to something like TRT? Yeah. How do we make sure genuine medical needs get met properly without accidentally normalizing practices that might carry unknown long-term risks? or practices that distract us from tackling the deeper societal health challenges that might be contributing to the problem in the first place. Lots to think about there.